We're live on YouTube. This is Friday. No, it's not. It's Thursday, <laughs> April 8th, uh, 2021. I should know it's Thursday. Because I just returned from doggy day camp with my doggy, Marley. And so Marley won't be disturbing us today. Um, yesterday, we voted out S99 and that relating to uh, repealing the statute of limitations for civil actions based on childhood physical abuse. Um, we did not. Uh, Senator Benning was unable to join us due to a court hearing. So um, if Senator Benning would like to vote now or ask any questions about the bill, we're happy to answer. Senator Benning is prepared to vote and would vote aye. Thank you. So that's five zero zero, Peggy. Yep. And, uh, yep. um, Senator Baruth, I already have the version. I'll Senator send it Baruth to you. is is um, oh, okay, and then I'll hit the bell. All. Yeah, and I did send a message. I haven't heard back from. Oh, I might. I haven't checked my email this morning, but I, I sent a message to John Bloomer and uh, Becca now regarding the S bill, and obviously didn't meet meet crossover, but how they want us to deal with it. It's an important bill and hopefully they will house will be able to take it up. So this morning we're taking up H183, an act relating to sexual violence. And our first witness is Michelle Childs who will walk us through the bill and try to understand, help us understand uh, why, would, why and uh, what changes the House made to the bill as introduced the rules of the bill. And so Repeat the number, please. H183, it's an act relating to sexual violence. I believe it changes our consent laws is the main thrust of the bill. <coughs> so, Michelle. Oh, Michelle, you're, you're muted. You're muted. Is it okay for me to share my screen, put my document up? Sure, sure. Um, yeah. Um, it was a cartoon in this morning's paper. People were meeting together, and the caption is, can we still use the mute button? <laughs> we're in a socially distanced meeting. So, um, so I'm going to walk you through. Uh, so the first few sections deal with amendments to uh, the statutes and the sexual assault chapter. Um, and then as Senator Sears, I think, mentioned a moment ago, uh, there's language in there about creating an intercollegiate uh, council that is going uh, to address uh, sexual harm on campus. And, um, and there's some couple provisions at the end, as well as some data collection requirements. So um, starting with section one, and this is the definition section for uh, the chapter on sexual assault. Um, and so we're starting out with the definition section and you'll see there's an existing definition of consent. Uh, so currently means words or actions by a person indicating a knowing uh, and, and voluntary agreement to engage in a sexual act. Right now it says a voluntary agreement. And so this is adding knowing and. So a lot of the uh, the tweaks around consent that are uh, incorporated into this into this draft were based on uh, federal law, Title X military code. If you look at the federal law, there's the, the with respect to military law, it's in Title X. With respect to elsewhere, it's in Title 18. The Title 18 sexual assault statutes are uh, fairly antiquated and they generally haven't been amended much since the mid 80s, um, as opposed to the military law has been, I think because of a lot of the cases in the news in the last several years and the military looking at um, uh, sexual violence within the armed forces. Um, they have done more, re much more recent updates to their statutes. And so I was looking to those as well as to, to some other states. And so I will send you some links to just in case you ever want to take a look at it. Um, and then I also will send you a couple of links to some existing Vermont statutes where I, um, where there's some core, some parallel language. 
So you'll see in the, it's adding a new def, a new definition in subdivision 10 of incapable of consenting. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is, again, based on federal law. Uh, incapable of consenting means the person's incapable of understanding the nature of the conduct at issue. It's physically incapable of resisting declining participation in or communicating unwillingness to engage in the conduct at issue or lacks the mental ability to make or communicate a decision about whether to engage in the conduct at issue. Who makes the decision that a person's incapable of understanding? Well, we are going to get to that. <laughs> okay, because that... Right. I mean, the I issue... Mean, physically un incapable, would, I would assume, means somebody's um, so intoxicated that they're, um, you know, comatose <laughs> or somebody is you know, unable to do anything, you know, what, what? I, I think maybe it, once I walk you through the other language and then you look at how it all works together and, and okay. circle I mean, back around, because some of those particular instances are specifically de delineated yeah. in the well, around what's incapable. Okay, of I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll wait, um, but incapable of understanding and lacks, lacks the mental ability, aren't they similar? Um, the, so the mental ability is, so there was, there was language previously in A3 that was addressing developmental, I believe developmental or psychological, uh, <coughs> disabilities. And, um, it was building on existing law and just updating terms. There was some concern expressed by advocates, uh, mental health advocates around having that. And so the language has gone a more general around that. But I would say that if you have um, uh, incapable of understanding the nature of the conduct at issue, it could be somebody who's incapacitated through intoxication, lacks mental ability to make or communicate a decision about whether to engage in the conduct at issue. I mean, it may fall under that as well, but you would also have uh, people who might have some type of uh, disability that may affect the ability to, uh, to communicate a decision. Uh, I'm willing to come back to this, but my question is for maybe witnesses who uh, may come forward, um, what, if somebody's incapable of understanding, wouldn't they also lack the mental ability to make or communicate a decision about whether to engage in the conduct issue? <clears throat> Senator Sears? Yeah. Michelle, I'm looking at 10, incapable of consenting means, and then I'm isolating the phrase in B, declining participation in. That just does not flow right, and maybe it's just me, but if you're incapable of consenting and you're declining participation in, you are capable of either consenting or not. I, that just, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I guess I'll look to Philip as the English specialist, but. I, I see what you're saying. It, it I'm happy to, you know, this has gone through a, several iterations in the house. I'm happy to look at, I'll compare it to the federal definition and see if I use that language or if it was using some of the language that's in the existing statute and bringing into to this definition. So I'll look at where it originated. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so section 3252 is your statute uh, for sexual assault. So subsection A, um, right now it's no person shall engage in a sexual act with another person and compel the other person to participate in the sexual act. So forcing that person, that is struck, but you have under here, so no person shall engage in a sexual act with another person, one, without the consent of the other person, two, by threatening or coercing the other person, three, placing the other person in fear that any person will suffer eminent bodily injury or four when the person knows or reasonably should know that the other person is asleep unconscious or otherwise unaware that the sexual act is occurring um so i will note that this knows or reasonably should know 
is a new standard within 3252. Uh, you do use it elsewhere in, uh, in Title 13. It's used in the statute uh, for sexual abuse of a vulnerable adult. It's also used in stalking. Um, so I just raise that and as I go through other uh, provisions, you'll see where it is used um, in another section. And then I think, you know, introducing you to all these concepts and then perhaps hearing from the witnesses and then circling back with me to have the discussion might might be most helpful, but just a suggestion. Could you just bring it back up a half a page? I think so. Oh, sorry, I'm having trouble with my Right mouth. there, hang, hang on right there. Mm -hmm. All right, so you've struck out and compel the other person. Mm -hmm. So we're down to no person shall engage in a sexual act with another person without the consent of the other. Is that now um, meaning simply that you have to have a formal acknowledgement that it's okay? No, there's some language that we'll get to in the next section that'll talk more about what consent is not. Um, but it, it does not require, uh, there's not a requirement here that there be like a affirmative mm -hmm. consent. Okay. Um, I, just, I just caution those that are watching on YouTube um, that feel like our questions are <clears throat> whatever, um, that we're going through the bills to make sure that, and I don't think anybody on this committee, and I know they would want this to happen to anyone. Um, the issue is, is it written well enough to not have unintended consequences or, it, or not be able to prosecute somebody because the legislature made a mistake in drafting the bill? Um, the conduct that we're discussing here is obviously a and, um, you know, and I think of some of the cases that we've heard about uh, like the swimmer out in, uh, in, at Stanford University, um, those need to be dealt with in the harshest possible manner. So hopefully people will understand that these questions are related to will the law work and will the law, would the law result in unintended consequences of innocent people being prosecuted or guilty people not being prosecuted because the legislature made a mistake in drafting. Thank you, Michelle, if you want to go on. Mm -hmm. So subsection B, and I, um, <clears throat> currently it just has the language, it just has one it's subdivision, it's just subsection B. Um, and that language currently reads, no person shall engage in a sexual act with another person and impair substantially the ability of the other person to appraise or control conduct by administering or employing drugs or intoxicants without the knowledge or against the will of the other person. Um, so this, uh, we've kept that, but just kind of restructured the sentence um, so that it would be no person shall administer any alcohol, drugs, or other intoxicants to another person without the person's knowledge or against the person's will. And while the person is impaired by alcohol, drugs or intoxicants engage in a sexual act with that person. Um, you may have heard of the case that came out, I think, last week from the Minnesota Supreme Court. Um, I know that Senator Peters had, I don't know if other are familiar with it in, um, in that particular case. There was a, a woman who had um, done, I think, believe like five shots of, of alcohol and taken an opiate pill. Uh, she was intoxicated. She went to uh, a bar to go in and she was denied entry at the bar because she was too intoxicated. And so um, when she was outside, uh, she met some men who invited her and I think maybe some friends to a party. And uh, they, uh, so the woman went back with the men, uh, but there wasn't a party and um, she quickly passed out on the couch. And um, when she woke up, 
um, and came to uh, the defendant was <clears throat> having sex with was was raping her, and um, and so this case was brought and what the Supreme Court said was that the uh, charge didn't apply because she voluntarily got was intoxicated. She caused her own intoxication. And so she, they said the statute didn't apply. This is something that's similar to that. However, we have other provisions that can be more of a catch-all around lack of consent. Um, so it's a little different. It's also different in the sense that um, in Minnesota, um, the, the way that it reads is that um, it's, a, it's third degree criminal sexual conduct um, with se sexual penetration with another person when the actor knows or has reason to know that the complainant is mentally incapacitated. And in Minnesota, they have a definition for mentally inca incapacitated that brings in the standard of, you, of the person being drugged or, or uh, by someone else. We don't have that definition here. And like I said, there's other provisions I think that can address, but I just wanted to kind of bring your awareness to this one provision. So the B1 is addressing a situation where someone is, you know, unaware that somebody has perhaps drugged their drink or something like that. Subdivision two is new. And that is no person shall engage in a sexual act with another person when the other person is incapable of consenting to the sexual act due to substantial impairment by alcohol, drugs, or intoxicants. And that condition is known or reasonably should be known by the person. So there we have the term incapable of consenting to the act. Something that's different between these two is up here in B1, it's around uh, when the person is impaired by alcohol. For this, on subdivision two, there's the addition of the word substantial. Um, so just kind of highlighting some of the elements there that I think probably witnesses will discuss and, and you may want to circle back around to. So subdivision one involves someone drugging someone else and engaging in sex with them. Subdivision two is engaging in sex with someone who is incapable of consenting because they're substantially impaired by an intoxicant um, but it doesn't, how they became intoxicated doesn't matter. Are there cases in Vermont where current law has not allowed a prosecution? I don't know. I would rely on the, on the witnesses to, to address that. Thank you. Um, so next section, section three, uh, and section, you know, I have to go back and I'll double check, but um, while you have obviously amended the sexual assault uh, chapter quite a bit over the last uh, couple decades, it's typically been around penalties, around, um, uh, around children, around things like that. This particular section has not been amended, I think, for, for, uh, for quite a while. Um, if ever, I'll have to double check. And so here it talks about the prosecution for a crime defined in this chapter, which is a sexual assault chapter, or section 2601, which is lewd and lascivious conduct. And these are the following provisions that apply. So the first one being that lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. So you can't just by the fact of that someone didn't fight back um, doesn't necessarily equal consent. Um, May I ask a question about that? Sure. <clears throat> so lack of verbal or physical resistance, but so lack of verbal, if somebody doesn't say anything at all, it still could be non-consent. Yeah, you're going to look at the totality of the circumstances. So it could be that it could be that somebody falls into one of these other categories in the sense of that they're impaired. It could be that they are um, under duress. Maybe they're fearful of, of, of rejecting the person because the person's been threatening towards them. Um, uh, I think there's it, 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 it means that you can't that lack of consent isn't 
it isn't dispositive by saying that the person didn't physically fight back or scream or anything like that. Where is the phrase totalitarian circumstances in the bill or in or at law? That's just I, I just a, a, a term, a legal term of art that we use in term in terms of looking at all of the evidence in, in order to make a decision. Um, so so in, in this, what, sub, what subdivision one is saying is that this is not that the issue of resistance, lack of resistance doesn't automatically equal consent. You would be looking to other things to show lack of, uh, lack of consent or that there was consent. Michelle? Yep. When I, when I look at one, two, and three, they're, they're all constructed negatively. They, they speak to what doesn't constitute consent. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think partially the questions will arise around what does constitute consent. I know that um, California has um, at various levels worked with language about active consent. Um, it almost seems like this phrasing is an attempt to avoid saying what what consent is. Um, so to go back to Jeanette's question, if there's if there's um, no verbal or physical resistance, um, how how does someone know whether there is consent? Um, I think that it could be in cases where there's impairment for intoxication. Um, it could be because of uh, someone's, uh, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know the, the right term, terminology around um, of like a mental impairment or a disability or an issue. Of no, I, I, I understand that those are, those are more easily understood situations where consent right. can happen. But if you imagine a, a you know, a, a situation without those, um, I feel like this pairs away what doesn't represent consent, a couple of cases of what doesn't represent consent, but it doesn't articulate what, what is consent. And so that seems like a gray area that we're, that we're um, working with. Um, because you could say, well, there was no resistance. The person didn't say no. Their conduct didn't say no. Um, so, at so I think you would then have to go back up to, you know, did the was the person um, were they incapable of consenting? were if were there was there ever uh, any other evidence there that indicates that the per that the actor should have knew or should have known that the person was not consenting yeah i'm i'm going to agree with philip though that there's such a thing called passive consent that doesn't have any of the the triggering language where someone knew or should have known but if those other those things don't exist this language in a separate section of trial procedure sort of just leaps out and screams at you that you've got to have an active consent statement otherwise you're in violation of this particular language and i i don't I'm not going to get personal here, but the the um, two people who are engaged in an act, one may be uh, willing, but is not verbally making any kind of statement, um, and is not intoxicated or under the influence of substances or whatever the case may be, but they are going along with it. Um, and not making a formal statement that they want this to happen. And to me, that's what this language says, <clears throat> lack of verbal or physical 
Resistance does not constitute consent. I'm troubled by how that could be applied in a, in a trial. Yeah, I mean, it just seems in, in I, I understand this is a fraught um, place in the law where, and in culture where we're trying to determine, you know, in dating, in sexual activity, what constitutes consent. And I know that, that that's the toughest piece, but the way this is framed here, three statements of what doesn't constitute consent, it, in any other bill, we would have a definition for what did constitute consent or, or whatever the X factor was. Um, well, so, you do have a definition of consent. Okay, where's... Where is it? It was the first, first thing I talked about. Consent means oh, right. actions by a person indicating a knowing and voluntary agreement. <clears throat> okay, so... Wow. so, so that, that really strengthens the argument, though, that the individual has to um, perform some words or actions and then there's no such thing as passive consent. Well, that the actions could be, I mean. Well, the lack of action could be passive consent. <laughs> I'm trying to understand. I think what the committee is concerned with here is a person has regret the next morning, perhaps, and then claim something. <clears throat> I just want to make clear, the concept of someone taking advantage of another person, I think, is behind this bill. And I'm in support of that concept uh, to try to correct that behavior. What I find as a potential minefield is ending up in a criminal trial where someone was not subject to any of the things we're concerned about that could manipulate them into a position they didn't want to be in. But rather, there was passive consent. And there was no formal action, no formal words, writings, or whatever saying, yes, I want to go along with this. And, and I, I'm troubled by how that language is connected here. I, I'm hoping we're going to hear some more from witnesses to try to clarify. That. Yeah. I'm I don't ever remember seeing in statute trial procedure discussed like this. Um, maybe it, maybe it's there and I didn't know it. Um, I guess it is because you have current language. What would happen if you took out two, three, four, Five. I mean, you already defined it up above. You know, I'd have to think about that and um, see whether or not there were that would create in any gaps or if it was covered by everything else. Um, yeah. Well, the, maybe which, the totalitarian. Maybe if it was clear the totalitarian totality of the circumstances. I just. I just Right, so the, the first uh, one through one through five are, are premised on federal law. Um, we do have under existing law currently lack of consent may be shown without proof of resistance. Um, and then you have what is now subdivision six. Is it okay? I keep walking through. Yeah, and please. I, I, I kind of see everything, and then we can circle back around. And so, uh, so the second subdivision is that an expression of lack of consent through words or conduct means there is no consent. So that's essentially no means no. Subdivision uh, three: submission resulting from the use of force, threat of force, or placing another person in fear does not constitute consent. Right. Subdivision five is a reference to um, the rape sh our rape shield law that consent shall not be demonstrated by evidence that's prohibited under our current rape shield statute. Um, so no bringing in the, the survivors uh, past sexual conduct and or way they were dressed, things like that. Um, 
And uh, number five, a sleeping or unconscious person cannot consent. Subdivision six, so you see this is amending the existing law. Um, under current law, it talks about whether the person was mentally um, or physically uh, incapable of, of consenting. So there's some little tweaks here. I would say the, the general changes to this subdivision are um, rather than requiring knowing, it's new or reasonably should have known. So changing the standard there, and then you'll see on subdivision 6A, striking mentally so that it would just be more generic using that new definition of incapable of consenting. So the person knew or reasonably should have known that the other person was incapable of consenting to the sexual act or the lewd or lascivious conduct. Subdivision B is that the person knew or reasonably should have known that the other person was unaware that a sexual act or a lewd conduct was being committed. And then C, uh, the person knew or reasonably should have known that the other person was incapable of consenting this, to the sexual act or lewd conduct with the actor because the person was substantially impaired by alcohol or drugs. Is it okay to go to the data reporting section? Sure. Yeah. So section four is data collection and reporting. Um, and so this is on or before September 1st of 2024. So it's a ways out and annually, biannually after that. Uh, DPS is to provide a statistical report to the General Assembly based on the um, NIVERS data um, and, and the Vermont Judiciary uh, on the following issues. And essentially what it is, is they are to compile county by county, looking at the number of sexual violence cases that were reported to any law enforcement agency. Um, then the number of civil sexual assault or stalking orders that were granted. The number of sexual violence cases that after they were reported to law enforcement were subsequently sent to uh, prof for prosecution. That's in C for potential charges. And then top of page five and D is the number of sexual violence cases charged and the nature of the charge and the disposition of the charge. So what it's attempting to do is to look at say, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of data out there that that it's a um, it's a fraction of, of sexual assaults are actually reported, but how many are actually reported in Vermont? And then out of those that are reported, how many are referred for prosecution? And then out of those were refer, referred for prosecution, how many um, uh, result in charges and what is the disposition and what is the type of, of charge? Was there a fiscal note on this? Uh, no. Could uh, we request I believe it's from... using. I believe it's using data. Um, my recollection. I'd like a fiscal note from the um, joint fiscal on section five. Okay. I'm just kidding, excuse me, section four. Cool. That's asking an awful lot from the Department of Public Safety and what we, and obviously Ingrid Jonas is here. She may be able to respond to the question, but I'd like a fiscal note on it. Well, and uh, Mr. Chair, if you add in what we were talking about yesterday um, in terms of the, the um, race-based demographic data, that was yep. a huge amount of data gathering, um, and it would come across the same agencies. Yep. Uh, my recollection was that uh, this, I, the crime research group uh, has a lot of this information, mm -hmm. and that's... Then why aren't they doing it? I mean, that, the question is, I'm not objecting to getting the data. I'm questioning how who's going to pay for it and how it's gonna be done in the current budget of the Department of Public Safety, which I go over yearly as part of my responsibility on the um, Appropriations Committee. And um, I'm concerned that um, we put more and more on people. And, and uh, for example, I hear you know that uh, what Senator Baruth just mentioned, um, in yesterday's conversation about the race, racial data. There should be a fiscal note on these things. And if, if the crime research 
group already has the information, why wouldn't we want to use them instead? Although I'm not questioning you, Michelle, I'm questioning the House's decision to go this route. And I think that there was a method to the madness. I don't necessarily uh, know what it is, but perhaps uh, <laughs> yeah. DPS can, can clarify. But my understanding was that, uh, that it was not going to be an issue and didn't require. Okay. Well, well, I think it's important that since they've got appropriations in this bill in a following section that we um, get all the information that we need to make a good decision about who should be gathering this information and whether it should be the crime research group or some other group. And, uh, oh, sorry, Michelle, you um, we're going to skip section five. Um, I'm okay. leaving that. There's a um, subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee that's looking at section five. Okay. Well, uh, section six goes with it. Um, yep. So I'm on to section seven for appropriations. Um, so the subdivision. Um, a or subsection A deals with the uh, with the task force or the council up above, so I won't talk about that. Um, nope. Pardon? Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, subsection B is an appropriation of forty thousand dollars to uh, the Center for Crime Victim Services to provide a grant to expand uh, for a pilot project, the Vermont Forensic Nursing Program. So this is. The training program for specialized uh, healthcare workers who can collect evidence af at, after there's been um, a reported sexual assault, and so uh, you know anything yeah. they have to be able to be specially trained because that evidence is important, and they have to log everything and be very careful around the um, the chain of custody. Uh, so the funds right now; those services are only offered in hospitals. Um, and the funds would be used to recruit, train, and uh, credential nurses to provide that type of care within either primary care or reproductive health or campus healthcare settings. So it wouldn't just be available in hospitals. Okay, I'm. I want to know why we would be appropriating learning money for this type of service to the Center for Crime Victim Services and not so. I mean, I why are they the entity? Yeah, why not the Castleton School of Nursing or the UVM School of Nursing? Or... Because they administer the forensic nursing program. Who, who, the Center for Crime Victim Services? Yes. I, uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say I, I think that's the best piece of the bill. It's, okay. uh, it's directed right at one of the biggest problems, which is that following one of these sorts of incidents, there's a lot of times not, not the people on the ground to help collect the evidence or to take care of the victim. So um, I think that would be money very well spent. So then in January of next year, uh, the center is to report to uh, your committee and House Judiciary on the progress of the pilot program. Um, and then a second time, November of next year regarding the implementation and results of the pilot program. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any further questions from Michelle? <clears throat> I know I skipped over the the uh, council, but uh, Senator Baruth will probably, if he has questions about it. Okay. <clears throat> the next uh, witness is Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director of Vermont Network Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Sarah, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, uh, you heard a lot of our questions, but you probably have prepared testimony, so feel free to do both. 
I will do my best to do both. And um, based on your questions this morning, I'll probably be able to answer some of them and some of them um, other witnesses will also be able to address. Um, but as the committee has been discussing this morning, and as you know from your much broader work, sexual violence is a significant issue which impacts thousands of Vermonters every year. And just by way of a very small bit of context, um, in the US, approximately one in five women and one in 38 men um, have experienced rape or attempted rape in their lifetime. And as with many other forms of violence, um, some individuals and communities are disproportionately impacted by sexual violence. And that includes individuals with disabilities, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, and uh, transgender and non-conforming, uh, gender non-conforming individuals. And here in Vermont, we're not exempt from those trends. So I thought it was worth highlighting that in the most recent youth risk behavior survey here in Vermont in 2019, which asked a series of questions to ninth through 12th graders across the state, um, more than one in four female identified students report experiencing unwanted sexual contact. Um, and students of color in Vermont are more likely than white students to ever been forced into sexual intercourse. And likewise, LGBTQ students are more than two times as likely to be forced to have sexual intercourse compared to their heterosexual or cisgender peers. Um, so I'll, I'm just going to speak briefly to the sections of the bill and then again would be happy and I'll try to address some of your questions as I go and then I'd be happy to take any additional questions. Um, the updates to the consent statute, I think State's Attorney Tebow will be able to speak to those probably in greater depth and with a much more direct understanding of the courtroom implications of those changes. Um, but certainly as <clears throat> understandings of sexual violence and its impacts have evolved over time, um, so too have definitions of consent. And the updates to the sexual assault statutes that Michelle outlined seek to more accurately capture situations involving drug facilitated sexual assault um, and to update language related to lack of consent um, through words or conduct, submission as a result of force um, and sleeping or unconscious individuals. It's kind of a area that, that was um, sought to be, to be clarified. Um, around section four, the data collection section, there are some good questions there. Um, so the intent of that section is to really collect in one place information about the legal system's response to sexual violence. And despite the high prevalence of sexual violence, as you know, the legal system often struggles to respond to these cases. So we know nationally for every 100 sexual assaults, only 23 are ever reported. Of those, five lead to an arrest and less than 1% of cases are ever referred to a prosecutor. Um, and after cases are referred to prosecutors, a very small minority of those cases lead to a conviction. So there's this incredible attrition in sexual violence cases. And there are many good reasons why a survivor might choose not to report an assault. But when they do, um, it's incredibly important that the legal system provide a, a robust and consistent response. Um, and so the language in the section was the result of stakeholder conversations with DPS, Crime Research Group, the State's Attorney's Association. Um, I think that's, that's it. Um, and the, what we heard from DPS, and hopefully you'll hear this from Major Jonas as well, is that what is outlined in the report is already within the scope of crime research groups existing contract with DPS. They will be able to create this report um, without any additional data. The data is already available to them and doable within the scope of their existing contract. Um, but the idea well, that is- That was my confusion. It doesn't yep. mention the crime research group. It mentions the Department of Public Safety. So um, that was a little bit of the preference of, of the House. They wanted to ensure that they were only directing um, state agencies and not directing private um, nonprofit organizations. And you'll see, I'll talk about another instance of that further down in the bill. Um, okay. But because DPS is the entity that holds the contract with Crime Research Group, um, they are the ones directed to create the report, but Robin Joy from Crime Research Group was the one that 
um, along with Ingrid Jonas was involved in those conversations. And I'm sure that um, Robin would, would be able to speak to the availability of that data and um, the availability of crime research group to perform what is called for or within the uh, scope of their existing contract. Okay. Um, on section five, uh, the Intercollegiate uh, Sexual Violence Prevention Council, I'd be happy to work with Senator Bruth or others on this section. Um, the establishment of this kind of standing council was a key recommendation of the previous legislative task force on campus sexual harm. Um, and the intent is really to serve to coordinate and, and innovate responses to sexual violence on campuses across Vermont, knowing that um, you know one in five female students and over one in five transgender students um, are sexually assaulted on campuses and that that age group 18 to 24, um, folks are four times more likely than people of other ages to experience sexual violence. Um, and so the intent is really, again, to just ensure that responses and prevention efforts on campuses across um, Vermont are coordinated and that resources are shared across both large and small institutions, private and public institutions. Um, so you'll see in section seven of the bill, uh, it appropriates a small amount of funds to the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services to um, essentially staff this council. Again, these were some changes that were made on, on the House side. When the previous legislative task force sunsetted, um, there was a discussion about the establishment of this new uh, intercollegiate sexual violence prevention council and who ought to staff that body, whether it um, could be a state agency, whether legislative council. Um, and what ended up happening is no one um, essentially raised their, raised their hand. The network said we'd be um, willing to do it, um, but we would also be happy to step back. And so there is a small amount of funds in section seven um, around providing the kind of administrative and coordinating support to that body. Um, in the house, there was uh, a certain amount reduced from that award for staffing the council to accommodate some needed per diems of members of the council. So um, one of our particular requests is that the amount in section 7A1 um, is restored to the original level in the bill as introduced, which it's very small. It's just up back up to $13,000 is what we would need um, if the network were the, um, the Center for Crime Victim Services was to ask the network um, to do this work. Um, and in section seven, the uh, forensic medical care for victims, Michelle explained that well, but I'm happy to provide some additional details. No, I think she explained it well. Okay. Um, so essentially, right now, the you know the center um, does fund that program, um, and right now the care is only available in emergency departments, um, and we certainly see the needs from survivors to have that care available in settings um, for patients who may not access emergency rooms, but still need that. Actually, care. trying to jog my memory, memory, but I think this committee actually started that program originally. I think months. you're right. I think you're right, Senator Sears. Uh, there's no objection to um, expanding the program or anything. It's just a question of where the money went. Yeah, again, that was also a change that was um, made on the House side. Okay. So I'm happy, happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Um, go, I find it, the section three to be very confusing. Um, it may be because we're significantly changing the current statute regarding trial procedure and the consent issue. Um, but I find it, um, I'm afraid of some unintended consequences and some things that may be, a, you know, that may actually be an assault under this. How did this get to where it is? 
Um, so I think that, uh, you know, I can speak to that from our perspective. I know that um, State Attorney um, Tebow uh, yeah. may, may be able to speak to what was um, drawn on from other states and jurisdictions and how the, the language mirrors um, mirrors those pieces. But I would just say that there was a um, desire to ensure that there was additional clarity in the statutes, especially around cases where people were incapable of consenting due to intoxication um, or being yeah. unconscious or things like that. And this was the way that um, the language was ultimate, where the language ultimately uh, ended. I, I would will also say, Senator Sears, that um, it is certainly our um, share your um, intention not to have any unintended consequences and ensure that this language isn't overly broad and unintentionally criminalizes um, behavior that ought not to be criminalized and by the same token um, doesn't leave out cases that uh, ought to be able to be prosecuted that cannot be. And, and my understanding based on conversations with prosecutors and uh, the experiences of survivors that we hear about is that um, most often these cases are actually just the cases that actually end up being prosecuted are uh, in this realm are, are egregious. Um, and these are people that are truly unconscious, semi-conscious um, and State Attorney Tebow can speak to that. But I think the intent of the language is to address those circumstances. I, I think it's number two on page three. I mean, section three, number two, an expression of the lack of consent through words or conduct means there is no consent. I don't know what that, that's, I guess, um, uh, State Attorney Tebow can explain that one to me. I mean, it clearly, um, submission route resulting from the use of force, threat of force, or placing another person in fear does not constitute consent. That's pretty clear. Um, lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. I think. It's just rewording what's already in law, lack of consent may be shown without proof of resistance. Um, but it's, I think I'm stumbling on two. Um, yeah, I can understand that. And I think as Michelle noted, I think it is related to the definition of consent and, um, and that those two things essentially have to go together, that there need to be words or actions by a person indicating um, some knowing and voluntary agreement. And so um, so I, I think that those two things kind of work together, I guess I would say. Okay, thank you. Are there questions of Sarah? I, I was just gonna jump in there and say, I, I think I understand the, the interaction between the definition of consent and then these provisions about lack of consent but I think part of the problem comes in that the bill is articulating at great length what doesn't con constitute consent, but then the definition of consent is very, very brief and vague. Um, so actions indicating consent um, seems like it begs more description or more, um, and without that, I, I feel as though some of these provisions in section three, um, it, it becomes more confusing for me than an overt statement of what consent is with articulations below that in the way that we've articulated what non-consent is. Um, and I, I know that that's hard, but I think that's where people's questions are originating um, is it's when you imagine the scenario in your mind, it's hard to think about what, what are the indicators of consent that the bill is referring to. Uh, I appreciate that. And I would just say, I do think it is, um, it is a, a matter of kind of policy and preference, whether, uh, you know, the state chooses to define consent positively or dispositively. And I think with either approach, there are 
courtroom implications for that. Um, and I will leave that to the prosecutors to highlight. I think, um, I thank you, Sarah, very helpful. Um, I think we'll go on to, um, I had John Campbell, but I'm assuming that Rory, uh, you both the state's attorney in Washington County is taking uh, John Campbell's place. Welcome to the Senate Judiciary, Rory. Nice to see you. Um, you too, Senator Sears, good morning. Uh, yeah, different being here remotely rather than in person. Um, yep. You've heard a lot of our questions and I'm sure you have some answers that will help us understand better. Um, so um, please proceed with the testimony and we'll be happy to hear from you. Well, thank you. And for the record, Rory Tiva, Washington County State's Attorney. And the uh, questions by members today are excellent. I think show a really good, complex, a under, good understanding of a complex to topic. Sex assault prosecutions and defense of those cases are uh, among the most difficult that anyone looks at. I think it's important though to add a little bit of context as to what the current state of law in Vermont is, where things could be improved. So I believe Senator Benning asked the question, or perhaps as you, Senator Sears, of, is any of this not covered by existing Vermont law? And there's a nuanced answer to that. Generally speaking, uh, this doesn't break new ground or, criminalize, or attempt to criminalize things that would not already be subject of a prosecution. But that said, our statutory definitions are relatively vague and broad. Instead, we rely on jury instructions and case law to really get to the answer of what is or is not consent or when there is or is not uh, a sexual assault committed. Uh, right now, on, in pulling up the Vermont model jury instructions, uh, lack of consent may be shown without proof of resistance. Uh, consent cannot, is, cannot be there when a victim was mentally incapable of understanding the nature of the sexual act, was not physically capable of resisting or declining consent to the sexual act, was unaware that the sexual act was being committed, or was mentally incapable of resisting or declining to consent to the sexual act due to mental illness or um, other um, issues with intellectual functioning. I think what's important though, just as a broad base is this, uh, as I mentioned, sex assault prosecutions are difficult. Sarah outlined the really sobering statistics of how few of these cases actually make it to trial. So there's a lot of gatekeeping already in terms of prosecutorial discretion or investigative leads burning out because of just the view that there may not be enough evidence. I think though, even the cases we bring to trial it's important to note that they, we are fighting every case against rape myths that are embedded among the population. The idea that someone could be asking for it when they allow themselves to become intoxicated or vulnerable in a situation. The idea that, well, you know, if someone didn't fight back, then is that really a sexual assault? Or the fact that because there have been prior sexual acts where someone was asleep or intoxicated, that that meant that there was then the ability to assume the future. One term that didn't come up uh, in the walkthrough or uh, in the other testimony is really the notion and nature of a mistake of fact as to consent defense. What we're dealing with here are our definitions and our framework that doesn't preclude other evidence showing that the state of mind of an offender, alleged offender, was influenced by other circumstances. So Michelle mentioned that while totality of the circumstances does not appear anywhere in the statute, that is necessarily what every criminal case turns on. It's all the circumstances, what was known to that person. Nothing here changes that sex assault or lewd and lascivious conduct as it may be uh, under the definition of consent are specific intent crimes, meaning the person who's doing it has to have the specific intent to engage in the sexual act or sexual conduct. Uh, so that doesn't change. And, and I think as everyone is aware, specific intent crimes are difficult for the state to, uh, to prove. So a few things, and I wanna give a step back and give a little bit of my context and contributions. So uh, I was able to assist and, and work with Michelle uh, throughout this and some of the language choices. Um, I don't expect everyone to know my personal biography, but before returning to Vermont, I spent eight and a half years as a judge advocate in the US Army. And during that time period, it was the peak of the military sexual assault crisis that started right at the very beginning of my service in 2008. And in 2008 was the first of three revisions to uh, military law revolving around sex assault, of which Senator Gillibrand in our neighboring state of uh, New York has been a leader in working towards more effective definitions, as well as uh, some of our home state senators and their contributions to 
to that work. With that said, uh, there's a recognition, I think, across, well, one, uh, advocacy, advocacy groups, uh, su you know, such as um, those that are part of the network and certainly among prosecutors. The nature of Type, nature and types of sex assault cases, or what we understand and appreciate to be sex assault, have changed. To give context, in Washington County, our youngest alleged victim in the past two years is three years old. Our oldest was 84. We've had victims who are male, female, non-binary, gay, straight, bisexual. We've had people of color. We've had uh, any demographic group you can identify can be a victim. What unifies many of these cases is that it's not the stereotypical predatory act of being drugged at a bar or being stalked and attacked out of the bushes. Instead, the most insidious cases and difficult ones are those that are acquaintances and also involve alcohol or recreational consumption of alcohol or drugs. This is particularly prevalent in college campuses or among our younger cohort group of 18 to 24 year olds. With that being said, the definitions that we have in Vermont uh, are not as modern, clear, or comprehensive as other states have adopted. Earlier, I noted that Senator Bruth referenced the California Penal Code and their definition of consent, and I'd like to share that with the committee. California has gone on to define consent to mean positive cooperation in act or attitude pursuant to an exercise of free will. The person must act freely and voluntarily and have knowledge of the nature of the act or transaction involved. Colorado also modernized their sexual assault statutes to include redefining consent. Colorado defines consent as sexual activity means cooperate. Consent for sexual activity means cooperation in act or attitude pursuant to an exercise of free will and with knowledge of the nature of the act. Illinois has adopted a, a similar theory. With respect to uh, the changes around uh, substantial incapacitation and the consumption, voluntary consumption, if you will, of alcohol or drugs, Kansas and Oklahoma are two states that have gone in this direction. Kansas uh, amended their statutes to indicate that a victim, that there is a sex assault where a victim is incapable of giving consent because of mental deficiency or disease, or because of the effect of any alcoholic liquor, narcotic, drug, or other substance which and which condition was known by the offender or is reasonably apparent to the offender. Oklahoma, again, has a similar definition and with respect to consent mirrors the direction which California and Colorado have gone. The term consent means the affirmative, unambiguous, and voluntary agreement to engage in a specific sexual activity during a sexual encounter, which can be revoked at any time. Uh, and finally, um, make reference to New Jersey. New Jersey uh, does not, they use a term called ineffective consent. And consent is ineffective if it is given by a person who by reason of youth, mental disease or defect or intoxication is manifestly unable or known by the actor to be unable to make a reasonable judgment as to the nature or of harmfulness or of the conduct charged to constitute such an offense. For several reasons, the New Jersey definition is a little bit more problematic in the sense that it implies this somewhat um, moralistic uh, view or could be interpreted to include that someone has to know that, let's say, pregnancy could result from sexual intercourse or something along those lines. What's been proposed in H-183 doesn't go nearly as far as that New Jersey definition. It also does not go so far as California and Colorado do have to have suggested uh, in their language affirmative consent. But I think it's important to note that the balance reached in H-183 first provides greater definition and brings out of instructions and case law standards that exist. In trial procedure, uh, which I know a lot of focus and discussion has been on today, really attempts to endeavor to ensure there's a statutory prohibition on using such rape myths as that, that because there was no resistance, uh, that there could not have been a sexual assault. Uh, and I'll just add as an anecdote, um, I'm sure uh, Senator Benning probably isn't missing jury trials and uh, voir dire at the moment, but you know, voir dire uh, with jurors is always an interesting process and people answer candidly and truthfully. And that's one thing I love about Vermont jurors. People aren't afraid to express how they really feel about a case. In just about every sex assault case where we've conducted voir dire, at least one or two jurors will raise their hand 
uh, when asked the question, you know, do you believe that a victim can invite a sexual assault based upon how he or she is dressed? Same as much as do you think if a, you know, someone uh, should be held responsible if they have sexual intercourse with someone who is voluntarily intoxicated. The concept or notion that people put themselves in harm's way or accept risk when they make certain decisions uh, is inconsistent with law, but it's an attitude that is pervasive among uh, some of our friends and neighbors in the community. It's not for us to tell them that that's right or wrong, but from a legal standpoint, we need to have a proper definition. And I think that the trial procedure, along with referencing um, our rape shield statute, codifies and takes out of just instructions or case law what the standard ought to be, which is those things that someone can be sexually assaulted and offer no resistance. Uh, in my house testimony I offered the, anal the um, analogy of this, many of us are familiar even as a very young age with the concept of fight or flight. So when something startling or scary happens, some people stand up and defend themselves. Others try to run away or avoid a confrontation. In the context of sex assault, there's, and really all responses, there's a third response, which I think we understand better um, today than maybe we did in past times, which is freeze. Some people, when faced with a traumatic incident or a stressful event, simply freeze and don't know what to do. And therein lies a, a, a difficult concept, which is can mere acquiescence or freezing in fear equal consent. When you think about the type of consent that's required for a medical procedure, going to the dentist, getting a COVID-19 vaccine, seldom would any doctor or practitioner just assume that they could go and perform surgery without some agreement or manifestation from that person. Sometimes that agreement to get a shot, let's say, can be as simple as a nod, go ahead, which is why the trial procedure, as Michelle pointed out, does need to be read consistent with our definition of consent, which is fairly simple, but also accurate in capturing it. It's a freely given, as defined, or as proposed to be defined, it would mean words or actions by a person indicating a knowing and voluntary agreement to engage in a sexual act. So sometimes there's beauty and simplicity, and I think that is a simple definition but it's a powerful one that imparts that there has to be something. So some words or some actions, it doesn't have to be words. So there doesn't have to be, I've heard people make jokes about having, you know, a written contract of I consent to this or that, you know, when people think about the concept of affirmative consent, that's not what the standard is. It's just something to show that. Mistake of fact is consent as a defense can be presented at trial, but I will tell you candidly, it's something that we consider as prosecutors from the get go. No one wants to put a victim unnecessarily through the trial procedure. It's invasive, it covers intensely private matters, and unfortunately, prosecutors and victim advocates often have to have the conversation, a very difficult conversation with a victim of crime and lay out the reasons why we don't believe we could prove a case at trial or overcome proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Other times we forge ahead and that process is unpleasant because the victim's mental health, substance abuse disorder, or other defining factors can come into play as to character, motive to fabricate, bias. And certainly some of those things contribute to why a defendant may or may not have reasonably believed that there was in fact consent for the act. So again, unlike a drug case where you have physical evidence on a table, three or four officers, maybe a cooperating individual telling you what's there, or property crime where it's caught on video. So many of our sex assaults take place with only two witnesses, the victim and the offender. It's a rarity when we have other third parties who have firsthand knowledge of what occurred. So these cases are necessarily difficult and they necessarily turn on the credibility and recollection of those individuals. Of course, that is more and more difficult when you have the influence of drugs or alcohol or things that impact memory. So I've, uh, I realize I've gone on probably longer than I need to. I hope that this narrative has answered some of the questions, but I, I'd really like to answer your specific questions. I mean, this, it, it helps me to some extent 
Rory, but I, I'm still stuck with, I have no idea what an expression of lack of consent through words of conduct means there is no consent. How um, <clears throat> two people are engaged in a sexual activity and at some point, I don't know what a lack, an expression of lack of consent through words of conduct means there's no consent. That it just doesn't make sense to me. And maybe I'm missing something here. Um, there's no question from either party there's been sexual activity, but what does that mean? So I think in, in practical terms, um, you know, as Michelle mentioned, no means no would be the easiest but other things could be um, someone trying- Nobody to... said, but an expression of lack of consent. Nobody said anything. Um, through words or conduct. So that's where I lead to the question, does somebody have to say yes? And that gets you back to what you described as- um, So I don't want to get you know too graphic uh, in public testimony, but on one hand, in a sexual encounter, you can look at two different types of contact between persons. Let's say in one sense, somebody initiates contact. The receiving or non-initiating partner of that then embraces the person warmly and proceeds. That embrace would be a sufficient basis to determine that the definition under 3251 is met, that that person is then through their actions indicating an agreement to engage or at least proceed further with that encounter, as opposed to if someone attempts to initiate sexual conduct and then that person tries to push away or rolls over or squirms out of reach of the person. I'm not sure that anybody would reasonably believe that to be an invitation to proceed further with that activity. And What's important is this definition applies not just to casual acquaintances or strangers who find themselves in an intimate situation. It can apply to people who are in a relationship. I mentioned before, acquaintance, you know, majority of our cases involve some degree of familiarity or an acquaintance. That could be boyfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, <clears throat> girlfriend, 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 husband, wife, 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 whatever combination you can come up with. It, we're not just looking at incidents between people who are loosely acquainted or don't know each other. There are sexual assaults that occur within marriage. And that often leads to a very difficult discussion of well, what was the past history? How were these type of acts initiated in the past? What type of things were demonstrated or done to show agreement to engage in a sexual act? Without getting graphic, I'm sure we could all think to our own experiences of intimacy and consider that Likely every time there's not some verbal acknowledgement of this is what's going to happen during an encounter. There, it, there doesn't need to be. And that's what's important in both looking at the negative expression under trial procedure and looking at the actual definition of consent. It's, I think, just emphasizing in, to, from my view at least, to understand or appreciate that Words and actions can go either way to demonstrate consent or to demonstrate a lack thereof. There need not be any words and there need not be any conduct without, someone can say no and not push back or resist and that it manifests a lack of consent. Likewise, someone can just lay there and say, yes, go ahead. And that would uh, constitute freely given consent. Okay, Senator Benning first and then Senator White. Rory, as I'm reading this, silence is lack of consent. And I am really troubled with that. If you take the definition of consent and the phrase under trial procedure, mere silence benefits the prosecution and strips away a defendant's ability to make any kind of an argument that there was interpreted consent by silence. Eliminate substances, alcohol, um, manipulation by somebody who is in a position of authority, eliminate all of those qualifiers and just focus on this phrase. It seems to me this 
crosses a very big line. And I, I can't, you use the term freeze. Who interprets freeze uh, now has shifted over to the defense to try to demonstrate that that wasn't the case. And I'm really troubled by going that far. I think all of us on this screen agree with the concept of the bill that someone shouldn't be manipulated into a sexual act. But when you eliminate all of those qualifiers and simply say silence equals lack of consent, that's really problematic for me. And by the way, I would love to get jury trials going because I don't know about your office, but my office and the office in St. Johnsbury, the prosecution there, we're all buy, buying file folders uh, to put our new cases in because we can't get rid of cases. And this is awful. When this trigger gets pulled, you and I are going to be in a real crazy well, good, mess. The good news is that's next week's agenda. And, I'm, and the bad news is the House didn't put any money in for the, nor did the governor um, put any money in to restart our criminal and uh, civil justice system. I, I don't want to get too I, far I'm off. I'm hoping that our committee will make significant recommendations towards getting the backlog cleared up in both criminal and civil cases. Well, um, I, I, got a, I got a letter from Justice Seaton. I, I, I today. think we're meeting next Thursday on that subject, Joe. I, Actually, I, it's I'd Wednesday. Love to hear it. Oh, well, I've been corrected. Peggy Sorry. says it's Wednesday. Stephanie couldn't make Thursday, so we switched it to Wednesday. That's uh, No, that's fine, Peggy. I just wanted to alert Joe and Rory that we're actually aware of that problem. It's unfortunate it wasn't in the House. Well, well Senator, Senator Sears, I just learned this morning from a letter from Justice Seaton that the various courthouses are actually ready for trials. But right. when he was asked, when's the first one coming, he didn't know. So well, I, I mean, there's, I don't know there's if that such fashions a, your witness list for next time. There's such a backlog that you may be happy to hear that there may be night court, Joe, and you'll be able to go to court at two in the morning. Nothing surprises me. But Rory, I anyway, just I want to leave the that subject at hand. Yeah, I, I want to leave that with you that silence now is clearly interpreted as lack of consent. And that troubles me. Um, somehow we've got to fix that. I just, I can't vote for this the way that's currently presented. Senator White. So Rory, when you were giving the, some of the more positive de definitions instead of the negative definitions, there was, there were a couple in there that I think really, uh, there was one about um, attitude that that was, could be construed as consent, the attitude. And I, I don't know why we would focus on what isn't here as opposed to adopting some of those definitions that you gave. And I can't remember where that one was from, but it struck me yeah. that it was something and attitude are construed as consent. I think that was Colorado. But I, I, that, it was either Colorado or the one right before Colorado. It was, yeah. Yeah, so both uh, both California and Colorado have used that terminology. Um, I'd be happy to send that to uh, the senators uh, by email uh, afterwards. I think Michelle already sent it to us. Great. Do you know why the House chose to go with negative definitions because of Joe's concern here that um, it implies lack of consent as opposed to going with a more positive definition? So you know that's a good question. Um, my, I guess my educated guess or understanding has been to try to amend and modify Vermont's existing statutory regime rather than start from scratch. If that makes sense, um, adopting the let's say California definition is is a significant change from existing law. So by inserting some minimal changes in the consent definition itself. Uh, it seemed that the balance was then to go back and take a look at and um, trying to clarify that in the negative under the trial procedure. And it is sort of odd, I will say this, uh, and this is a criticism of uh, a past legislation and where we get to, 
many other states for rape shield, it's a rule of evidence, not a statutory uh, construct. So I think Vermont is ahead of the curve there by making sure that it's a clear standard built in statute, not just a, a court rule. But with that, we have then this adjunct trial procedure, which um, some states have, and a lot of others do not. The analogous federal and military um, statutes do not. Instead, it's just a statutory definition uh, of consent and, and what it is. So if nothing else during this process, I've learned in looking at a number of other states, we have 50 different standards, 50 different sets of definitions, or 51 if you add you know, the federal and military side into it, all have benefits and disadvantages. Uh, but one thing that I did testify to the House and spoke to Michelle about was the more we could tailor definitions to an existing standard, in this case, the, the federal military standard, which has been updated uh, several times with a lot of uh, U.S. congressional scrutiny leading up to it, the better. Uh, it means that Vermont courts have a, a specific jurisdiction, uh, particularly federal jurisdiction, to look to in terms of how to interpret these. And anytime, as you think everyone's well aware, anytime we go back and change a statutory definition, it opens up the question of well, what did the legislature mean and also what do these words mean in this context? Um, so doing so in a deliberate way that can loop back or reference, cross-reference existing case law is helpful. In the House testimony, uh, the Defender General's representatives had expressed concern about you know, due process, what these definitions mean. And I think that was really the cognizance of trying to avoid those type of pitfalls where we give some new or undefined definition there. Um, so ultimately, I would say this, there are different benefits and uh, detriments of other regimes. Certainly the California definition of consent is interesting because it goes in greater detail on the positive side of things. And I would say, uh, I would certainly encourage uh, this, this committee to consider that definition in lieu of the existing consent definition, if that would be viewed as better than trying to prescribe things in the negative in trial procedure. Well, we've been given, I mean, Michelle has sent us copies of California, Colorado, Illinois, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Oklahoma, and Oregon. I never pronounce Oregon right, I guess. Uh, so we have those. Uh, I'm going to suggest, unless David Schur is on a real tight time scale, that we take our 1030 break now and come back at 1045 um, to continue on. No, 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 that's fine on my end. I, I can talk about this with Peggy, but I, it might actually work out best if I get moved to the bottom of the list and say I'm triple booked okay. this morning. Um, no problem. That, that's fine. Um, we can pick up um, and take... Rebecca Turner, if she's going to be ready at 1045. I know that Ingrid Jonas is only available at 1145. So I can't go back that far for you. That's fine. Let's, uh, happy to have uh, Attorney Turner go before me, and, and hopefully I'll be back in, in time. Okay. Rory, thanks so much.